Hello students, welcome to the second week of your elective course Asia Cultures and Identities. My name is Ngoc Nguyen, but you can call me Ruby. I will be responsible for the Chinese part of the course that our beloved Jerry often teaches. This week's lecture builds on what you've learned last week about identity and applies that to our key topic about Chinese-ness and Chinese identities so that we can gain a better understanding of what it means to be Chinese. Before we start, uh, just a quick reminder, there are two assignments running at the moment. Uh, the first one is a short writing exercise called Who Do You Think You Are? Accounted for 10% of your final grade. So this gives you an opportunity to review what you've learned about identity and apply that to reflect on your own identity. I look forward to reading it. The deadline is approaching soon, so try not to miss it. But the second one is an accumulative assignment called a notebook assignment. It started last week, week one, and it will run throughout the course. So the idea is that you should be paying attention during lectures, tutorials, the things that you do. For note taking, it's usually a very common practice, but often take for granted that students would figure out a way to do on their own. But in this course, we want it to be an explicit, intentional and guided activity. So there are several things that you're expected to write down in your notebook. So please review the instructions, the guidelines provided on my uni. Whether you do it digitally or handwritten is totally fine, but it accounts for 20% of your grade, which is a lot. So make sure that you read, understand, and follow those in instructions so you can build a habit of taking good notes. All right, um, housekeeping is done. Let's move on to the main content this week's lecture. So last week we discussed the concept of identity and hopefully you've checked out the required reading for this week. So everyone at some point would wonder about who they are, the concept of the self, um, what does it mean for an in individual being like me with my background, uh, with my circumstances living in the world. And essentially, the self-identity can be both self-defined or ascribed by other people. I thought it might be useful to borrow the concepts, the sociological concept of the I and the me from George Mead. He uses I to refer to the full self, right? The full identity that you as a person perceive of yourself. Why the me, sometimes written in plural, the me's, refer to the very different roles that you play in various social contexts. And in these different contexts, um, you will interact with different people and kind of reveal a different side of yourself that's most relevant most likely to help you succeed in that context. So for example, um, when you stay at home watching TV with your parents, you may talk, you may behave very differently to when you're out with your friends um, in a coffee shop. This is because of the different expectations, um, different circumstances that you're interacting with to be accepted in that situation. And so the main idea here is that there are many factors that influence the way you carry yourself, you behave yourself in a particular situation. And for different people, um, they may have a different idea about you as a person. They may perceive you very differently depending on uh, how much they know about you, uh, what kind of interactions, um, all of these contextual you know, factors. But it doesn't mean that you're pretending or faking or acting because throughout all of the experiences, you are the constant, you are uh, the one who experiences all of these interactions and uh, playing all of these roles. So 
the, the, the self-defined identity or the I can be considered as a holistic, uh, the full identity. Uh, but this is, of course, is very relative because how you perceive yourself can still be very much influenced by how other people perceive you. And these two sets of identities intertwine with one another, they interact, they, they influence each other, they change each other over time. And I have this comic here that illustrates the point that we're talking about using the heart and the brain character. Like when you're trying to post something on the internet, like you have some clever ideas that you want to share, but then on the one hand, um, you're also wondering about um, whether people would also find it clever or funny or interesting as you do, or how it would affect uh, how other people see you. Uh, this is all the things that go in behind the scene when we try to navigate the different identities that we want to put forward um, to certain uh, group of people and certain circumstances. So to sum it up, um, identity is a socially, culturally, and historically constructed concept. Okay, this is weird to kind of use passive voice as being constructed by these different forces. Although uh, when you identify, when you judge people, when you perceive people or perceive yourself, it's a very active process. And then it can be subject to very explicit or implicit shaping by your upbringing, how, uh, how your parents taught you, the cultural norms, the religious institutions, or your government, right? And these factors make up the subjective, the contingent or contextual uh, nature of identity is always um, evolving depending on um, your situation so all of the people in your life that you come to interact with build relationships with the places you travel to the live events that happen to you good or bad they all contribute to the shaping of your identity and onto how you view yourself and how you perceive other people so your identity is a bit like an iceberg, right? And very little of an iceberg is actually visible above the waterline. And just like identity, the most visible things about who we are can be often quite limited, not too telling about the complexity of the being inside. And the list I show you on the left of the iceberg here is by no means comprehensive. It's just some commonest examples to help you get the idea. So above the waterline, when you first meet someone, you most likely see how they dress. Uh, so clothing or attire. This might include jewelry or other accessory. And also their general physical appearance right like their skin complexion their facial structure the hair color and depending on how observant you are on a scale from one to Sherlock Holmes these visible traits can inform you a little more about the person underneath uh, those layers like for example if you see them wearing a ring on their left ring finger it may suggest they married gender or um, age or racial backgrounds can also uh, be indicated by the physical appearance too. But that said, it's increasingly important that you don't make assumptions about other people's identity. Instead, it's important to communicate with them. It's not just because we are becoming more and more aware of uh, how diverse people are, but also it's a crucial part of education we need to learn humility and respect this diversity inclusive compassionate in short treat other people the way you want to be treated so back to the topic at hand um, in the deeper end you can 
also get to know more about a person's interests, their hobbies, their education, their career, health conditions. And these factors in the deep level involve more complex and nuanced issues than a straightforward answers like you're this or you're that. If we talk about nationality, usually you would think of it as a very straightforward um, answer, right? Like um, you're from this country, you're from that country. But in fact, nationality can be determined by birth or by self-identification um, when you when you grow and travel and interact with people you become you feel like you identify more with the set of values rather than um, the values that you're uh, used to in your home your birth country um, or it can it, nationality can also be determined by adoption and like for language as well is is a big part of um, your identity because it tends to outlive your nationality or your racial and ethnic background right and it can be either determined by birth again or by adoption by education or assimilation all of that and of course all of these factors are closely connected to each other right and just like the iceberg because it's a full iceberg it's uh, one full entity this means that the factors above the waterline, for example, or the ones at the waterline can have some indication for those on a deeper level and vice versa. For example, the way someone dresses sometimes gives you a hint of their social economic status um, or their even their religious beliefs, right? And somebody's physical or mental health conditions can be also linked to the outward appearance. Another point that I want to make here, just like the iceberg can melt and change shape over time, the elements that const constitute a person's identity are fluid and evolving. As I mentioned earlier in the definition of identity, it's not rigid, it's not fixed. So it's important to bear in mind the um, basically the diversity, the complexity underneath. Using the same iceberg analogy, we can think about the two concepts of uh, surface description and critical analysis that we, one of the readings discussed, right? Um, it is very two different skills. Um, surface description often only touches on well the surface of things the most visible things and reports them in a descriptive way on the other hand critical analysis focuses on the more hidden the more um, implicit and complex issues underneath the surface and to be able to perform critical analysis you would have to draw on different sources of information to make logical, reasonable observations or arguments about something. So I've talked quite a lot. <laughs> I hope you've been keeping up with your notes and um, also I want to remind you not to overdo your notes early on because it's hard to sustain over several months of the course. Uh, it's important to filter information as you note down and for now let's take a five minute break um, so you can pause the recording go have a stretch or water watch a funny video whatever and then we come back and finish the rest of the lecture okay i see you in a bit welcome back um, to review a few concepts we've discussed i thought i briefly introduce myself so who am i well i am me to apply the concepts of I and me earlier. I cannot possibly tell you the full self-identity, but I can tell you a bit about the me's or um, my ascribed identity. So as I said, my name is Ngoc Nguyen, I also go by Ruby. So right off the tip of the iceberg, my appearance can tell you that I'm a female Asian person. My surname can probably tell you that I'm from Vietnam 
or at least have Vietnamese background. I'm currently doing my PhD at the School of Education here at the university. My research is about using movies uh, in teaching, which is actually how I met Shoko and Jerry. They both participated in my project. And um, so my role back then to them was a student, a junior researcher, and now I'm their colleague. Before coming to Australia, I did my bachelor's and master's degrees in Japan. I lived there for a while. So I also speak Japanese in addition to Vietnamese and English. Alongside my PhD, I'm also finishing a diploma of counseling. Um, so to the people at the counseling institute, I'm a future counselor licensed to have my own practice. And I also have a few hobbies, uh, such as embroidery and painting. Um, and I have my work sold at a local art gallery on Instagram. So to my customers and the gallery staff, I'm mostly an artist. So you can see I have a few different roles to different groups of people. And sometimes we talk, sometimes I share things outside of a particular role. Um, but essentially, I try to respect the professional boundaries of keeping the me's uh, more restricted to uh, the context. So my parents and my close friends know about the different roles I have. So uh, their idea about my identity is probably closer to the self-identity or the I that I have about myself compared to the people at work. So what about you? Uh, I look forward to reading your assignment. And don't forget, it's due soon. Enough about me, uh, let's now apply what we've learned so far to the case of Chinese identities, right? China today, um, in today's world, has an increasing significance in politics, economics, and other important aspects. So let's ask ourselves, when somebody mentions China, what are the first things that come to your mind? Some people might think of China as a communist state. Some even say China is a totalitarian state. And while well, believe it or not, some people still think of China as a Confucian state, forgetting that China has had nearly 200 years of continuing revolutions trying to rid the country's image of Confucianism and declaring itself as an atheist said. And what about Chinese people? You know, uh, I'm sure you're aware of some stereotypes about Chinese people. And here's just a few examples of Google images. The first pic though, um, I think uh, captures very accurately the harmful and the hurtful consequences of using stereotypes based on um, biases or inaccurate information to treat people because it says China virus on a knife appearing to be stabbing a woman. And then not only foreigners use stereotypes towards Chinese people. Among Chinese communities, there are also many, many stereotypes, very strong about specific uh, Chinese group, Chinese minority groups. So the problem with those with using uh, stereotypes, with those stereotypes, is that most of the time they use very loaded and complex concepts and issues. But the people who use them, generally not motiva motivated by facts. When they use stereotypes to judge or to overgeneralize people, instead they're motivated by emotions. They're looking for a shortcut to justify their feelings towards someone or something. It is as if they're looking for evidence to, to justify, to prove their feelings is right. But ironically, you need facts, proven, verifiable facts, to pass on judgments like that. And where do you get those facts? You do research, you read up peer review research outcomes using um, data collected and analyzed um, and in fact each of the stereotypes that I show you earlier ranging from communism Confucianism to coronavirus features a whole complex body of research 
evolving with new books and journals uh, articles being published every day and the perspectives presented in these materials don't always agree with one another it's just say that it's this open debate on those topics so when somebody concludes that China is this stage or that stage or Chinese people are like this or like that it's important to ask what the evidence is right what's your evidence and then more importantly whose definition or what judging criteria are we using to make that conclusion and what level of understanding uh, of those people regarding these concepts is and granted there are less sophisticated stereotypes sometimes people can use stereotypes for fun for humor but they still rest on surface description right the above waterline characteristics without considering the complex and diversity within and as we've discussed those do not reflect the depth of identity of someone or something not only that those surface stereotypes can discourage us from using our critical analytical thinking skills to develop a more informed understanding or awareness and over time um, it can consolidate into your ascribe the ascribed identity of someone or something it can even result in some regrettable phenomena like cancel cultures or mass bullying so in short we don't want that throughout this course we want to expose you as much as possible to the diversity uh, underlying even the simplest most commonplace uh, ideas uh, related to cultures and identities and at the same time we want to help you develop your critical and analytical thinking skills rather than surface description so that you can approach any future situations with a more open compassionate mind not free of stereotypes but more self-aware uh, how those are influencing you so let's use this awareness to get us back to China because that's the topic of today. So how much do we know about the diversity within the so-called Chinese identity? So first stop is national identity. Well, national identity is often ascribed rather than self-defined because most of the time it's people from other countries from outside who try to define a nation to gain an understanding officially about 92% of Chinese people are descendants of the Han ethnic city and the remaining eight spread over 55 minorities and many would argue that these figures don't really add up because of um, such great diversity but this can be considered to be part of the century-long government campaign to promote harness, um, to unify the front by linking uh, the, the ethnicity to glorious dynasties or myths about the yellow emperor and things like that. And some of you may even recall that following the May 4th movement in 1919, the Republic of China was founded under the famous slogan of five races under one union, right? To unify Han Chinese people and Manchus, Mongols, Tibetans, and Muslims, the major four non-Han groups of Chinese people. So officially is the word that we want to emphasize here. Officially, 92% and 8%, officially 56 ethnicities, but unofficially, many more. Because the history of recording and classifying uh, minorities in China was done in a rush, highly politicized circumstances, and with limited information as well as strong stereotypes. And having a minority ethnicity almost always leads to negative outcomes uh, economically or socially or even life expectancy. China has approximately eight major language groups. There's a so-called Frankenstein principle named after a famous sinologist. 
uh, John Frankenstein. Uh, he said that whatever you say in China is only typically true in only one place at a given time. Because China is so big and so diverse in its languages and dialects and accents. So language in China is one of the major differences. And as you can see on the map, there are numerous dialects and local accents because the actual geography of China is so different we end up with great variations in vocabulary variations in singing variations in humor styles it has all sorts of connotations and local accents can sometimes be a sense of pride or embarrassment depending on where they're from uh, and the stereotypes associated with that place. But at the same time, it can also be used to shape individual identity very strongly, ascribed or self-defined. Chinese identities also feature diversity in religion and beliefs. So we touched on a stereotype related to this earlier about China being a communist state and Confucian state in some people's mind. Um, but the question is, can they be both? Can, can China be both communist and Confucian? Well, that depends on what you mean by communist, right? Over, for over a hundred years, these two concepts were contradictory in terms, because to be a communist, then if so facto, you need to also be anti-Confucian values, but then it also depends what you mean when you say confusion. So when people say confusion, some oftentimes they refer to the various strains of Chinese philosophies and laws and practices and religions, but they overlook or even are unaware of the great diversity of other factors, such as uh, legalism, uh, Moism, Taoism, Buddhism, so when somebody uses Confucianism or Confucian, when they refer to Chinese culture, it's often a crossover simplification, disregarding historical analysis. So apart from the so-called three great teachings of Taoism, Buddhism, and Confucianism, they are also folk religions, a bit of a mixture of all of the three, with more variations depending on the group of people that practice them. And Chinese people also practice Christianity, notably two official churches, the Patriotic Catholic Church and Self-Protestant Church, among other unofficial churches. And then there's also Islam, a state permitted Islam, is also part of the religious landscape in China with long history but the practices tend to be ethnically determined. And recently there's been a growing interest in the signification of Christianity and Islam, um, making these uh, religions more tailored uh, to the Chinese cultures and interests. So the map should give you some idea um, about the different religion practices in China but over history, um, an important concept to consider when you think about how um, Chinese people feel about religion is syncretism. It's a lot more gray, it's a lot less black and white, um, and it's more about trying to reconcile the different values and principles and practices and parties, sometimes even opposing ones. Um, so that's a strong tendency we can observe um, in this context. Another significant aspect of Chinese diverse identities comes from the extremely complex lineage system. Historically, uh, lineages used to be extremely important uh, in Imperial China, in which reproduction center around preserving the privileges of the family lines or clans and families within that system play a crucial role in training individuals because families are responsible 
for the behavior of the individuals within. The concept of uh, filial piety, meaning the unconditional, unquestionable obedience and loyalty to the family patriarch, was and is still employed as a key to promoting the discourse of lineages. This is sometimes just stripped down to mean doing whatever the family patriarch said, doing whatever the person older than you said, or doing whatever the male said, you know. The discourse and principle of lineages, um, however, have experienced some major turbulence around the early 20th century, where blood-based ties or kinship came to be perceived as a source of backwardness, a social conserv uh, conservatism, and also an obstacle to, to economic development to women's rights. Because back then, women used to have no power, except in very limited ways over their own children. And the fact that China used to rely so much on agriculture and was on its way to industrialization, the principle of lineages lost a lot of its value, especially after the Chinese Revolution of 1949. The Chinese Communist Party took control of mainland China in the 1950s. The discourse of blood lineage temporarily shifted away from the national and racial concerns and focused more on the struggles of class identity. So during the early 1950s, uh, Mao's land reform basically terminated the power of reproductive ties between powerful lineage groups in rural communities. So this means that throughout China, previous ruling classes uh, of such as um, landlords, rich farmers, um, capitalists, they, they were all devastated as their land was confiscated from, from them and distributed to poor landless peasants, uh, soldiers, workers, uh, and private uh, merchants and capitalist industries gradually became state-owned as well. So at this point, lineages were seen, as I said, an obstacle to economic development, socialist revolu uh, revolution. And it also informed very powerful ideological education about class, enforced to bring about a more appropriate socialist or worker thinking. It was an ideal time to be a soldier or worker um, because the ones very powerful and wealthy entities like landlords and capitalists brought misery and pain and even death during this period of time. And also uh, the increasing urbanization and the one-child policy that you may uh, have heard of also delivered um, very serious blows to the discourse of Chinese blood lineage. Another dimension of Chinese identities I want to discuss today is education. If you watch any popular drama series depicting Imperial China or even modern day China, you'd know that education or academic merit mainly in the form of studying and passing um, competitive exams is key to advancing one's career or obtaining economic success. Uh, it can also influence your life chances in jobs and marriage. And education is actively promoted in the official teachings of Confucianism, an indispensable virtue, future in post-Mao society. Education is also treated as the symbol of being enlightened or civilized because you're literate you can read you can write so you're respected in the society and in this context education is not a standalone system it's closely related to many other systems um, notably the hukou 
or the household registration system, the Google, uh, the high school examination system, and it also relies a lot on networking uh, relationships among peers. So what's the Hukou system? It basically categorizes the Chinese population into two classes, rural and urban. This status then determines where the citizens can receive public services such as health care, uh, education, um, pension rights, loan privileges, um, public schools for their children. So basically, the bigger place your huko is attached to, the better. The more rural it is, the more limited your access will be to education and social services, um, and consequently, uh, employment opportunities and so on. This system is believed to be the symbol of social inequality in China. It's been called for termination or major reforms in recent months this year, many cities uh, and province governments have announced their reforms to the local Hugo system. Another import, important system when it comes to education in China is the Google system. Uh, it's basically an examination uh, for Chinese students to take in their third or final year of high school, usually in early June. Uh, it's extremely high stake as it's the only criterion for admission to Chinese universities. Uh, it includes a series of exams, typically Chinese literature, mathematics, uh, and a foreign language. And then for extras, if you're in liberal arts, you will need to also take history, politics, so geography, and for science majors, um, this will be physics, chemistry, or biology exams. And prior to taking this really important exam, um, students need to fill in forms where they choose the universities uh, they want to enroll in next year. And the exam scores obviously determine whether or not they can do so. This make or break event is notoriously stressful, known to lead to high suicide rates, to the point that you will see many um, Western celebrities like Jim Parsons or even Stephen Hawking would reach out to their fans to wish their good luck. And because this is such a formative experience to take these exams, students rarely see anyone during this period apart from their teachers and classmates, so this often becomes the foundation of their social networks for the rest of their life. Um, so this is why these relationships are so precious. The Google system is arguably the least unfair part of the bureaucratic system, so it's very difficult to change. Um, but this creates a strong incentive for parents to send their children overseas to study abroad um, so they could avoid it or have a second chance or have a break. Being a large country stretching over a massive range of landscapes, China diversity in cultural identities is also expressed in the cuisines. There are major variations north, south, west, east, central as you can see on this map and it can also result in variations in local customs and practices like martial arts you know that isn't just kung fu as popularized by movies um, and because of such huge variations and diversity it can lead to many stereotypes that we touched upon earlier uh, among different Chinese communities. So, all of this leads us to the discussion of young Chinese individuals. How do these factors influence the way they identify themselves or how other people view them? And you can probably imagine the various layers of identity here, ranging from their place of birth, 
the place of ancestor worship um, and associated family history and clan and family pride which can be very much which can very much shape their sense of belonging you know sense of place where they belong and then they also, we also need to account for their language related identity and as well as their town the place or regional identity so let's take a closer look at this illustration i think it's quite clever and you may recognize from the required reading so far that there's a lot of tension going on in how younger chinese generations uh, come to understand when they have many conflicting images, expectations, or experience throw their way. So what do you see first when you look at the illustration? You see the bubble tea, the baseball caps, uh, the flags. Either way, it tries to illustrate that the confusion and the conflict, the tension, the inner conflict of having multiple ways to identify them. So in one way, it can be really good that there's uh, diversity, there's complexity, but at the same time, it can also be difficult, you know, so that in the illustrations you see on the face, typically symbolizing one's identity, is left blank. Let's end the lecture with a small quiz to cap our discussion today. Um, just do it mentally, you don't need to write out anything for the multiple choice. Um, how many assignments do you be doing? Uh, true or false? Each person has one version of identity and is unique to them. What are three broad forces that can strongly influence the formation of individual identity? Which are some skills that this course is trying to teach you? Uh, which word best characterizes Chinese identities? Their society, culture, and history uh, as per uh, our definition. Sorry, that's, um, that's a technical issue. The correct answer would be all of the above. And then the word best characterized Chinese identities is diverse. For the last two questions, I'd like you to note down in your, in your notebook, especially the second one, what facts about China and its identities covered in this lecture you find most interesting, most relatable, and why. And hopefully thinking about this question will give you some idea about potential topics that you can choose for your research essay in the end of the course. All right, um, thank you for joining me today. Uh, I see you in the tutorials next week. Uh, in the meantime, take care of yourself.